so today's first reading is from Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Well, before we come to second reading, just to orientate you, we have been spending a few months uh, going through the year of the Lord's favour in Luke's Gospel. Uh, We don't normally follow liturgical calendars, uh, Christmas, Easter, but a good one to at least remind us of our history as Reformed Christians is Reformation Sunday. So that's the Sunday closest to the 31st of October. And uh, while I'm not going to give you a history lesson, I'm going to preach from Romans 1 which was central to Luther's understanding of the gospel in a sense that triggered the Reformation movement. And so if you have your Bibles open, open them to, or turn them on, uh, turn to Romans chapter 1. We're going to read from verses 8 through to 17. They will just preach from the text of 16 and 17. We believe this is God's word. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also, who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Amen. And may the Lord give us understanding of his word. Well, we'll pray. Seek God's blessing upon the proclamation of the word and then we'll open it up. Father, we, we thank you that your word is truth. It is indeed a light for our path, but it also is powerful. Uh, it has the power that it can transform hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. Indeed, it, scripture describes it as a hammer that can shatter rocks and a, a double-edged sword. Oh, how we pray that in the power of the Spirit that sword might be wielded to the glory of Jesus and to the building up of your church. To this end, we commend ourselves to you that you might use the the weakness and folly of the preaching of the word uh, to fulfill all your purposes amongst us. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I may have mentioned this before. Uh, But perhaps one of the most uh, traumatic experiences um, in my life was when I was a... I did the most shameful thing when I was a teenager. Um, The first time attempting to steal with a couple of mates and they suggested that we go to the local supermarket and steal some chocolate. And so this was my virgin run and it it was a distinct failure. I was caught taken up to the manager's office, grilled. But anyway, the bloke said to me, I'm not going to call the police, but you are going to go home and you're going to admit this to your parents. And I can still remember with absolute clarity and still a great deal of emotional discomfort. I still remember my dad's words to me that day. He says, you will never tell your mother. It will break her heart to know her son is a thief. And you know, I lugged that shame around for decades. And rightly so, because what I did was shameful. 
But there were also other things. Perhaps things that other people think of as shameful, but that we don't. Like my sons, who are notorious for wearing socks and sandals in public. Or our pianist, Daniel, who steadfastly has refused to bend to the wind of fashion since at least 1978. Or Steve McDonald. <laughs> Steve. He drove a barina in public, a barina in public with no disguise for I don't know how many years. And then there are Christians who own poodles, eat tofu, and think reading The Guardian is somehow cerebral. My, my point is, there are some things that some people actually consider as shameful, but that others do not. And, and Paul says, the gospel is one of those things. There are some people who think the gospel is shameful, that they think Christianity is embarrassing, who think Jesus and all those who follow him are weak who considered his teachings at best awkward, but at worst, shameful. And from state premiers to state schools, from journalists to janitors, to influencers to investors, academics to accountants, there are a whole bunch of people who think Christianity at its best is just embarrassing, but at its worst is actually shameful. And so here you get Paul who's resisting that, he's rejecting that, he's rebuffing that idea. And then he's going to, and he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the good news. And then what he's going to do in verses 16 and 17, he's going to unpack the reasons he's not ashamed. But he's not denying that there isn't shame attached to the gospel. It's true that the gospel actually attracts animosity and shame like honey and bees and banks and profits and big governments and fewer freedoms. You you cannot have one without attracting the other. So I want you to be clear this morning. The gospel comes and attracts shame. Shame that that, that God calls certain things sin. Shame that, that God is both holy and angry at sin. Shame that that, that God is just and will punish sin. Shame that God calls all men and women and boys and girls to repentance and faith in Jesus as their only hope. A shame of the exclusivity of the gospel. That outside of Jesus, there is no forgiveness and no reconciliation. And you see, because the gospel comes with shame, the the truth is, whether we like to admit it or not, we're sort of reluctant to embrace the gospel publicly because of the shame. Sort of like when my sons uh, come around for lunch and then I notice that they're wearing socks and sandals. And you know what I do without even telling them? I just quickly cancel the reservation at the pub And I suggest, hey, why don't we change the plan? Why don't we eat at home where it's private and we'll be unseen and unshamed? Or, you know, like if your kids go off the rails and all of a sudden you become reluctant to speak about them in certain circles, or your grandkids, or your parents are daggy teenagers, you've got a daggy mum or dad, probably mum, and and you're sort of reluctant to be seen in public with her in case your friends see you. And that's what shame does. It, 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 we're reluctant to be associated. And here is Paul and he says, but I am not ashamed of the gospel. I understand the gospel comes with shame, but I am not ashamed. I understand that some people think of the gospel as embarrassing or homophobic or outdated or weak or foolish or unscientific. I get it, he's saying. But I'm still not ashamed of the gospel. Why? What is the reason that Paul gives that he is not ashamed of the gospel? He says, because I understand the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the, the Jew, also to the Greek. He's not ashamed of the gospel, he's saying, because he, he, he actually gets it. The gospel is powerful. It is life-giving. It is life-changing. It is transformative. It can literally take the gospel preached, shared, declared. 
that can take a heart of stone and they can actually turn it into a heart of flesh. And it can make the, the spiritually blind see and the spiritually deaf hear and the spiritually paralyzed walk. That's sort of powerful. It can take a hater and a murderer and a blasphemer like Saul and transforming into a servant as an apostle of Jesus Christ. It can take a 23-year-old mocker of religion, a disrespecter of God like me, with a misplaced confidence in my own goodness and turn me into an occasionally useful Presbyterian minister. Listen, Paul experienced the transformative power of the gospel. I've experienced the transformative power of the gospel. And if you are a Christian here this morning, then you've experienced that same transformative power where God has taken your heart of stone, of unbelief, and he has turned it into a heart of flesh that you might love his son and walk in his ways. And in Paul's day, he witnessed it from town to town, from city to city, in journey to journey. He saw Jews and Gentiles transformed. He saw pagan cities turned literally upside down by the gospel. He saw crowds that were not only convicted, but converted. That all resulted in, in sacrifice and obedience and worship and mission. And in his day, the apostle, he witnessed the power of the gospel amongst the young and the elderly. And so can we. It's the, it's the power of the gospel to, to work in the lives of young people and old people, of, 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 of mechanics and the mentally ill and the same sex attracted and the porn addict. And, and, and I've seen it. I've seen it for myself. I've seen the angry calmed. I've seen marriages transformed. I've seen spiritually passive men become leaders of their home because of the gospel. Listen to me. Of course the gospel comes with shame. But I'm not ashamed of the gospel and nor should you. Because the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, Jew first, but also to the Greek. And then what Paul does is he adds his second reason why he's not ashamed. Because it also reveals how God's righteousness is revealed, or indeed received. Look at verse 17. For in it, that is the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Uh, this is the very text. This is the light bulb moment for Martin Luther, who at one point, he used to despise the idea of God's righteousness because he just saw it as oppressive because he could never, ever, ever meet the demands of God. God was too righteous and too holy. And then the light bulb went on for Luther and he read that verse and he realized, oh no, this isn't so much speaking about God's righteousness as an attribute of God, but in fact, how we receive God's righteousness. how God's righteousness is actually revealed and received in the gospel through the active obedience of Christ who keeps the law on behalf of sinners, in the passive obedience of Christ who died in their place. It is, he's talking about that righteousness which is credited through faith or by faith. What, what theologians call an imputed or a foreign or an alien righteousness, which is not your own, but comes to you because of the Lord Jesus Christ and faith in him. Think of it like this. If money goes into your bank account, uh, maybe not on a Sunday, but let's say Lily was going to earn $100 for chopping down uh, young, some young kid who was pretending to be a tree. It was on a Monday, so no great sin. Um, but when that money eventually lands in her bank account, it's what she was promised. It was what she was due. It is, it is money earned. But what Paul's talking about is a righteousness in the gospel which is revealed, that is received by faith, and it's more like a gift of money that lands in your bank account. And all of a sudden, you, 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 
you look in your bank account and there is $100 unexplained, unaccounted for, and it's a gift from a family member or a friend. And it is, it is undeserved and it is unearned. And Paul's saying, this is what God's righteousness is like in the gospel. It is received by faith. And from start to finish, this righteousness is by faith alone, in Christ alone, or as he says in the text, from faith for faith, the righteous shall live by faith. Calvin argued the phrase, faith from faith for faith, that what Paul had in mind is that the gospel gives us faith, so that we might grow in our faith. That was certainly true in the days of Abraham. In Genesis 15, 6, we read, And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted it to him as righteousness. And you've got the gospel in Genesis 15. And that's why he quotes from Habakkuk 2, 4, because it says the same thing. The righteous shall live by faith. How will you live? How will you have eternal life? By faith. And that's where your righteousness will come from. So from start to finish, this righteousness is received by faith alone in Christ alone. And, and Paul reasons, therefore, he says, that's why I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That's why I want to get around all the world. And I want to come to Rome because I want to bang on about Jesus Christ and those who can have eternal life by putting their hope and trust in him. Because this gospel of which I proclaim and which I am an apostle is powerful, it's transformative, and it reveals how God's righteousness is in fact received, which is by faith. That is, God is gracious and kind to us, and so the salvation is a gift received by faith, not earned, certainly not deserved. But it wasn't just Paul who wasn't ashamed. It was Jesus also. Hebrews 12.2 says that we are to fix our eyes upon Jesus. And that tells us why we're going to fix our eyes on him. Who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. What was he doing in enduring the cross? Scorning its shame. Jesus understood there was shame involved with the cross. That's why, in a sense, it came with weakness. It, the, the gospel always comes with uh, almost embarrassment. And Jesus knew that shame of rejection and mockery. Remember, his friends abandoned him. He's beaten by enemies. He's spat on by strangers. He's, he's stripped naked and nailed to a cross like he was a lawbreaker, a criminal. And though, in fact, he was shamed on the cross. That's the whole point. It's ridicule. It's mockery. It's shameful. He says he wasn't ashamed of the cross. Even in his moments of dereliction, even as he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He focused his mind on the joy set before him. That even though soccer, uh, sinners mocked him, he would save them. And even though the cross was shameful, it, it actually brings salvation. And even though he would die in shame, he, he actually set his mind on the fact that he would be raised in glory. And so he focused his mind on the joy set before him. And so here you have both Jesus and Paul, and they're refusing to be full of shame. And they're refusing to be ashamed despite the shame. They refuse to be silenced despite the hostility. They refuse to give up despite the opposition. Why? Because they both understood the transformative power of the cross. Of course the gospel comes with shame. Of course it does. But you should not be ashamed. Some people, some churches, they deal with gospel shame by gospel silence. That is, they really speak about Jesus outside the church. I hope that's not you. It certainly isn't us. But that's how even evangelical church deals with gospel shame by gospel silence. 
It's why churches are dying all around us. It's why so many evangelical churches are missing one, maybe two generations. It's why churches not only don't, but can't grow. They can't grow. It's not possible to grow because they've lost confidence in the gospel as the power of God for salvation. And so the shame that comes with the gospel causes them to actually be ashamed. And because they're ashamed of the gospel, they then become silent about the gospel. If you don't talk about Jesus, if you don't talk about the kingdom come, if you don't talk about this good news that God redeems sinners through Jesus the Christ, if you're silent on those things, then you have felt that shame and you've now become ashamed. And that's how eventually that silence in the church seeps into compromise and then perhaps even appeasement. That's how all evangelical churches die. All of them. It's how every church dies. Because it allows the shame, so they feel ashamed, and being ashamed, they become silent. So let's apply it. We, we know, we, we can... We can feel, you can feel, I know this. You can feel the shame that's attached to the gospel by our culture. The shame of a God who judges sinners. You know that's shameful. You know our culture finds that shameful. The shame of a God who calls all sex outside of marriage, sin. The shame that if we don't celebrate gender confusion and homosexuality, that somehow... We're all haters and bigots, the equivalents of some sort of sexual Ku Klux Klan. We feel the shame. Make no mistake, we feel the weight and the pressure of cultural disapproval, and that leads to this temptation of silence. Surely the whole City on a Hill saga has taught us at least that. When Andrew Thornburn was asked to choose between church and employment because his, his pastor had preached a sermon some 13 years ago where he spoke about homosexuality and abortion, giving the same answers, by the way, that the church has given for 2,000 years. And then we all watched the media baying for blood. In a matter of hours, Thornburn has resigned. And then it was a turn at the pastor, Guy Mason, to face the media. And if you're listening to Koshy, Dan Andrews, Peter Dutton, as well as most of the media, they made it, I made it really clear that the gospel comes dripping in shame. Daniel Andrews reckons Christian teaching on homosexuality and abortion are, I quote, appalling, intolerant and bigoted. Peter Dutton, the leader of the opposition, so-called conservative, he said those same Christian views were, I can't believe he said this, he didn't realise the irony, he called them an abomination, an abomination. And I actually think the irony of his word selection was actually lost in him and most of the Liberal Party. I don't care who you vote for. Actually, I probably do, but for the, for the sermon's purposes, I actually don't care who you vote for. When it comes to condemning timeless Christian beliefs, Labor and Liberal are a unity ticket, as are the Greens and the Teals and pretty much everyone else. You better get used to that. You don't have a seat at the cultural table anymore. Having our culture accept our Christian values and particularly our sexual ethics, our claims about Christ and the exclusivity of the gospel is really an historical anomaly. And we've lived the historical anomaly and we think that's normal and real and we're all shocked when culture turns against us. So you better get used to a gospel that drips in shame. Cultural shame. Welcome to the world of the Christians in the Middle East or Asia, and much of Europe, where the gospel comes with opposition and shame. But even so, you shouldn't be ashamed. And you certainly should not be silent. Not at the dinner table when you're sharing meat and wine with your non-Christian neighbours. Not at the gym when you're speaking to some heavily inked, ripped atheist or agnostic. Not when you're speaking to your local tradie over a cup about the difference Christ makes in marriage and parenting. 
Not when you're discussing federal politics with your neighbour who walked away from Christ as a teenager. Not when you're discussing culture or news with your friends online. Not when someone asks you, what did you make of the whole Thorn, Thornburn Circus around the water cooler at work? Not when you're picking up the kids at school and someone asks you what you did on Sunday, on the weekend. Not when you're hunting and camping or four-wheel driving with your mates and someone mentions their marriage or porn or women problems. Do not be silent. Do not be ashamed. Because the gospel is the only power to save. It's the only hope of reconciliation. It is actually the only means of human transformation. And it is the only foundation of justification, sanctification and glorification because the gospel is built on that. And so I want to affirm to you this morning, no, no mistake, the gospel comes with shame. It's dripping in shame. But Paul says, don't be ashamed. Why? It is the power of God to salvation for all who believe and in it is revealed God's righteousness, how it is received by faith. Don't be silent, church. Don't be ashamed. This is a great gospel. Let us, let us stand confidently on it and be confident that God will honour his son through our fidelity. And all of God's people said, let's pray. Our Father, we, we understand the gospel does come with shame, but we are not ashamed. We have tasted the Lord is good. We have seen in our own lives and our own families and friends, amongst our neighbours and those who we've shared the good news, we have seen the transformative power of the gospel. It is your power to salvation. And that's why we're not ashamed. And the gospel is also gracious and winsome. It reveals a righteousness that is received by faith because of your goodness and grace. So in Christ alone, by faith alone, that's why we're not ashamed. That's why we will not be silent. So embolden us and encourage us and, and most of all, help us to dig deep in the gospel that our own lives will reflect that gospel power and flowing out of that, a confidence, even in the face of opposition and shame, that the gospel is powerful, the gospel is good, uh, the gospel is gracious and the gospel saves to this end, hear our prayers, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to respond uh, to God's word to us. We're going to do that in uh, two ways. Uh, one, we're going to sing a song of response, which uh, will be in Christ alone, but also in our free will offering. But I just want to make it clear that as we take up a free will offering, this is an act of worship for God's people. So if you're a visitor or you're not a Christian, just let those offering bags go past us. This is our act of worship uh, to the Lord. So let's stand and we'll sing together our song of response in Christ alone. Music.